What's up, future respiratory therapist? In this video, we're talking all about the central chemoreceptors. You know those little things in our brain that make us breathe? That's what we're talking about. Let's dive in. All right, so as I stated here, we're talking all about the central chemoreceptors, and um, it's important to understand how these work. Before we dive into that, Let's talk about the Respiratory Coach Academy. Check out the link below to bring you to this page where you can find all of these courses that I've created to help you along your journey. The TMC Bootcamp and the CSE Bootcamp, essential elements to pass that MBRC exam on the first attempt. Go check those out. And then I got a formulas course, a pharmacology course, an arterial blood gas course, and a recently launched anatomy course, um, as well as my free resources that you can enroll into absolutely free. Again, link in the description below. Go check it out. Now, when we talk about the central chemoreceptors, the first things we have to remember is where are they located? They're located um, in the medulla. And so when we think about that, and they're on both sides of the medulla, and they are bathed in this bath of uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So that, that's a kind of important to understand because um, where they're located tells us and reminds us that when we are thinking about the breathing process, that the central chemoreceptors, they are the primary drivers of ventilation. Then we realize that ventilation and breathing starts up here. And that's important because oftentimes as respiratory therapists, we get caught up in the airways and in the alveoli and in the diaphragm and in the muscles. And we focus here on the chest, but we cannot forget that our job is to satisfy people's neural drive to breathe. And that's really, at the end of the day, a very major component. Now we're gonna talk about how these central chemoreceptors work but from here, I'm going to give you an application of this information so you hopefully use it for the rest of your career. So, all right, so we've already identified where they're located. And what it really looks like is this. I'm going to um, not do that. I'm going to draw this right here. So I'm just going to say central chemoreceptors are right here, okay? So like I said, they're on either side of the medulla, and they're sitting right there. Now, around them, again, is that cerebral spinal fluid, that SCSF, okay? And so I'm going to draw another layer right here, and I'm going to fill it with this kind of greenish-yellow color, okay? Now, this is CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. And then I'm going to put one more layer here, and I'm going to fill this one with red because this is... Um, I'm just going to say PaCO2 because what we're talking about here is arterial blood, okay? So first key point to recognize here is that the central chemoreceptors have zero interaction with the arterial blood. This is what we call the blood-brain barrier. You see, that's the, the arterial blood and arterial concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide do not have direct um, interaction with the central chemoreceptors. And so what we learn is, is that the central chemoreceptors are responsive in normalizing ventilation in response to rising or falling CO2 levels. And while that's not entirely false, it's also not entirely true. Because what we realize is that the central chemoreceptors respond indirectly to arterial CO2 but they respond directly to hydrogen ions. Now, this is where it kind of always gets tricky, especially for me when I was going through RT school, I would always get lost on this. I was like, what do you mean hydrogen ions? Well, let's try to break it down for you here. What we know is, is that in our arterial blood, we have levels of CO2. And this membrane right here is what we call the blood-brain barrier. Now, this blood-brain barrier is um, resistant to bicarb and hydrogen from the arterial blood. But see, what's interesting is that CO2 in here moves freely into the CSF. 
Again, CO2 moves from the arterial blood into the CSF as our CO2 levels rise. Now, once it gets into the CSF, that, that carbon dioxide is going to dissolve into water or with water, not into water, but with water. And then this is going to create carbonic acid. Now, we know that carbonic acid disassociates into bicarbon hydrogen. So the CO2 comes in over here, combines with water, and then ultimately leads to an increase in hydrogen ions. Again, CO2 combines with water to make carbonic acid. Carbonic acid dissociates into bicarb and hydrogen. Hydrogen ions right here. So the more CO2 that comes in here, the more hydrogen ions or the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions within the cerebral spinal fluid. That is what the central chemoreceptors respond to. They go, wait a second. We've got a whole lot of hydrogen ions here. We need, to, we need to breathe more so we can get rid of these hydrogen ions indirectly caused by the arterial CO2. Now, when we breathe more, we will reduce the level of CO2 in the arterial blood, which will reduce the amount of hydrogen ions in the CSF, which will reduce the drive to breathe. And that's what it all comes down to, okay? And so let me give it to you like this. Increasing CO2 equals increased hydrogen ions in the CSF. So we're talking about arterial blood, CO2, leads to more hydrogen ions in the CSF, which leads to a greater stimulation to increase the minute ventilation. The opposite is true as well. I'll put it down here. Decreased CO2 in arterial blood leads to decreased hydrogen ions in the CSF, which leads to decreasing your minute ventilation and your drive to breathe from your central chemoreceptors. That's what it all comes down to. Egan's does a good job right here. We're in uh, chapter edition 13, Egan's. Chapter 15, page 306, <clears throat> it says it right here. Um, when PaCO2 increases, CO2 diffuses rapidly through the BBB. What is that? The blood-brain barrier into the CSF. In the CSF, the CO2 reacts with water to form hydrogen ions and bicarb. The hydrogen ions generated stimulate the central chemoreceptors, which stimulate the medullary inspiratory neurons. Therefore, PaCO2 is indirectly the primary minute-to-minute -minute controller of ventilation. I'm going to use these words again. CO2 is indirectly the primary controller. What's the, what's the direct controller? Hydrogen ions. So... There you go. That's the central chemoreceptors, how they function. Egan's goes on to talk about how when you're dealing with a chronic situation with chronic hypercapnia, then these receptors um, <clears throat> get uh, decreasingly less responsive to the rises in hydrogen ions. That's a different conversation for a different day. But how do we apply this? Okay. What's the application here, Joe? And the application is simply this. Um, let's take this blood gas, for example. We've got a pH of 7.52. We've got a PaCO2 of 26, and we've got a bicarb of 24. Now, this is a decrease in your arterial CO2, but let me tell you a story. I can't tell you how many times I've gone in, either as myself as a clinician or with the students at the bedside, and we get told, like, oh, we're trying to get this person extubated, but they keep failing their SBT, their spontaneous breathing trial. And I say, well, why are they failing? And they say, well, they won't breathe. Okay, well, why are they not breathing? Look, every patient will breathe unless they are brain dead or overly sedated. Other than that, or have some type of traumatic brain injury. Other than that, they're going to breathe. Okay. And so 
Um, none of those were the cases. And so I say, well, why aren't they breathing? Well, the apnea alarm keeps going off. Well, what's the apnea alarm set on? 20 seconds. I look at the arterial blood gas, and this is what I get. Now, let's just think about this. Decreased CO2 leads to decreased hydrogen ions, which leads to decreased neural stimulation to breathe. Hmm. So what you're telling me is that all we need to do is let that apnea period go a little longer. And I'm at the bedside. We're watching this patient. But we're not going to let that apnea alarm kick in at 20 seconds. We're going to turn that up a little bit. We got to let this CO2 rise. As it rises, hydrogen ions will rise and they stimulate the central chemoreceptors to breathe. And we extubate that patient every single time. So my point is, is don't let your patients sit on a vent like this. We don't, this is, this is too low and this is alkalotic. We, we don't need our patients to be sitting like that. And so your critical understanding of these principles to so your critical understanding of this will help you in preventing possibly one, two, three days of prolonged mechanical ventilation because the patient wasn't breathing. Because we understand how the neural drive works and how the central chemoreceptors work. I promise you, take that to the bank and you'll be a better respiratory therapist for it. Hey, I'm Respiratory Coach. Stay here with me right here on YouTube. Hey, we just surpassed 75,000 subscribers and I wanna thank you all so, so much. I'm gonna make a deal with you. If you can help this community get to 100,000 subscribers by the end of this year, I have a huge message for you coming in January, but we got to get there by the end of 2024. Uh, also, come follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Respiratory Coach, LinkedIn at Joe Lewis, and always send me an email, respiratorycoach at gmail.com. I want your questions. I want your comments. I want your thoughts. I want to talk with you about respiratory therapy. Whatever information I can share with you, I'm here to share. Okay. Hey, remember at the end of the day, average is easy. Don't be it.